Cool. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So, uh, yes, my talk tonight is, uh, again, about the relationship between uh, C++ and the uh, linker, specifically the dynamic linker, uh, and about how if you're working with C++, if you want your code to work, you can't just get your C++ code right. You also need to know what the linker is doing. Uh, and it's not, not always clear how the uh, concepts in the C++ standard and linker world uh, relate to each other. Um, so uh, like the first half of this talk, I'm, I'm going to focus on OSX and uh, Linux, but you know, the ideas I think are, are <laughs> applicable to um, uh, Windows and other OSs as well. Um, and really just using some very simple code, nothing complicated to, uh, to explore some of the uh, basic concepts. Um, so yeah, it is part two of a talk I originally did, would you believe it, two years ago. Um, maybe just a quick show of hands, anyone who did manage to watch part one before? Yeah, oh, cool, yeah. Um, not quite everybody though, so uh, yeah, I'm just going to play the whole thing now. <laughs> um, no, I'm joking, of course. Uh, so I want to get straight into an example, actually. So this is a very simple code structure that we're going to use as our toy today. So um, the rest of the talk is all around this. We're just get building a simple executable. Uh, it links to a couple of libraries, foo and bar, and they in turn link to some logging library. Um, and there's, uh, there's not much in here, it's just a bit of a toy. So let's have a look at some uh, code. So our foo and our bar, they just sort of do some logging and return a value. Um, and we've got a, a log function we can call. Um, we've got a singleton logger, and it's going to print some stuff. Very simple. So to start with, we've got everything uh, statically linked. So we, we are building static libraries for foo and bar, also for our logger. Link the whole thing together. Cool, that all works. And you can see down here, it's printed something, and the answer is 42, so that's good. Uh, but then we decide uh, we want to use shared libraries. So maybe our executables, we're building a lot of them, and they're getting too big, or they're taking too long to link. Or maybe we want to deploy the libraries and upgrade them later. All the usual, usual reasons you might want to go for uh, shared libraries. So we have this other version of our toy we can build, where foo and bar are now shared libraries. And we're going to link to a, a shared library version of our uh, logger. And we didn't touch any of the code, but let's say we did uh, mess something up a bit, which we'll figure out later. So when we try and run this one, we get all this mess. Um, now, as an aside, when I did part one of this two years ago, I only showed uh, OS X stuff. Obviously, I'm on a MacBook. Um, but uh, I can actually show you some uh, Linux stuff now, because in the intervening two years, I finally learned how to use Docker. So uh, yeah, um, didn't even come up on my performance review, but that's fine. Uh, so if we want to build in here, uh, this is now a Docker container that's running um, a Linux distro, but it's actually just running against the, the same source code. So there's our static version. Uh, if we want to run the shared library version. Slightly different error, but similar problem. OK, so something's broken here. So then someone comes up to me and says, hey, Dave, look, I got this weird compiler error. Can you help? At which point I say, compiler, are you serious? Have you even watched part one of my talk? <laughs> I sent you the link about 10 times. Uh, and I go, OK, OK, I'll watch it, I'll watch it. So then they come back and say, all right, OK, it's not a compiler error. It's a linker error. Uh, but look, I've done my homework. It says it can't resolve this symbol. But this is, you know, it's declared here. It's got external linkage. Um, so I went and I looked in my. Uh, symbol table. Here's our symbol tables for the shared libraries we built. This is the, these are heavily filtered by the way to just the symbols we want to see. Uh, and here it is, look, the symbol is defined. So it should work, right? Uh, let's look at the OSX version. Here's our uh, symbol table for our shared library again. Look, it's defined. So why doesn't this work? Should this work? And the answer is, well, yes, but actually no. So this isn't an error from the linker. This is actually an error from the dynamic linker or the loader. That's the first thing. So here on OSX, we have this guy, dyeld. 
which is our uh, dynamic linker. On uh, Linux, it didn't show the name of the program, but it'll be ld.so there is, uh, is what's running. Um, and that's what can't find the symbol. And yes, the symbol is in the symbol table of your library, but uh, you can't see it. It's not visible. Um, it's not visible because your actual linker, LD, did not make it visible. And that didn't make it visible because your compiler did not tell it to. Uh, and the C++ standard really isn't going to help you too much uh, to figure out what's going wrong here. So again, what is my point here? Once you start using shared libraries, there's a whole new set of things that come into play. There's new programs to deal with, DILD and LDSO. There's uh, new concepts to learn, new traps to fall into. Uh, and it's even less clear how any of this fits into the C++ standard. And to top it all off, it's even more OS specific. So I just find this interesting that as a C++ developer, you, you run into this stuff. Um, and it's not, of, not often clear how it works. All right, but let's take a step back. Um, I'm going to do a very quick recap of part one at high speed, and, um, and then we can look at what the, um, the dynamic linking actually involves. So in part one, I talked about this process where your compiler actually runs over here and just produces object files from source files. But there are C++ language rules that apply to your entire program. So now we're over here. Big blue rectangles are virtual address space in this talk. So you've got uh, everything finally laid out, and here's your program. It's specifically, the one definition rule applies over here. In between, your linker is putting your object files together uh, to build your executables or your uh, shared libraries. And just a reminder that uh, these static libraries, um, it's really just a bunch of object files wearing a trench coat. It's not really a library exactly. It's just several object files together. Uh, I did also talk about what is uh, the virtual address space. Each process has its own one, and parts of it might be shared and used in more than one. Uh, I quickly covered what object files have inside. So you've got code sections, you've got data sections. And then symbols are really just labels for um, the addresses of uh, functions or of uh, data. And the linker, uh, the static linker, has two main jobs to do. It's got to resolve undefined symbols by finding them in other object files. And it's got to do the relocation, so where we're going to refer to another one of these symbols. Once it knows where the address of it actually is, put in the correct address and decide on the memory layout of the whole thing. Uh, we went over some important C++ concepts. So these are all things that do exist in the C++ standard. So uh, you get one translation unit. Uh, for each object file. Headers, they're just copy pasted in and then we forget they were ever headers and nothing special about the headers. Um, C++ has the idea of definitions. So in one of your translation units, you are going to define the actual address and content of some function or some global data. Um, and some declarations are definitions, some are not. And then the dreaded one definition rule. If you ODR use something, it means you need its address. You're going to call the function or you're going to point to the data. And in that case, uh, you are allowed to have inline symbols where you can have multiple definitions, but you've got to make sure they're identical. Otherwise, you're only allowed one definition in the entire program. And there's that entire program again. So we, we ended up with a very rough mapping of concepts. I do mean very rough. And again, terminology here depends on your linker. Um, but roughly speaking, in C++, C++ land, where we have a definition, we ended up with a defined symbol. Uh, if we ODR use something, but it's only declared, then we have an undefined symbol we've got to get from somewhere else. Stuff with internal linkage ended up with local symbols, external linkage global symbols. And our inlines all turned into weak symbols, which means they can be collapsed. All right, end of quick recap. So let's have a look at shared libraries. So just a reminder what shared libraries actually are. So when the loader runs, we're going to load our main program into memory. And then we're going to find a load of shared libraries. And they also need to be loaded into virtual memory. So the first thing we have to do with that is find the files. And we'll touch on that later, because that's another source of fun. We're going to find these on disk somewhere and load them. They may already be loaded. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, they, they can be shared, in which case the read-only parts, at least, we can just map into the virtual address space. Um, and then. From here, we may be uh, calling into symbols 
uh, in one of the libraries, or they may be accessing symbols from each other. So one thing to note here is that we don't actually know what address we're going to load this library at when we build this file. If we had to choose one specific address in virtual memory space for the library, then every process that's going to use it would have to have it at the same location. That's obviously not going to work because they'll, they'll conflict. So it's only when we load this that we know what address this is going to be at. Uh, so we'll come back to that as well. Um, and uh, to add to the fun, uh, on many OSs, you can also load libraries on the fly from your code, uh, DL open, and just get them into your virtual address space as well. So your whole entire program kind of exists when you've loaded all of those, but you can load things on the fly as well. And then so maybe it's not the same whole program anymore, I don't know. Um, cool. So what happens then if we're going to build something, an executable or a library that has dependencies on uh, shared libraries? Um, we're just going to look at a very simple case of our main from main.o and our foo.o into libfoo. So um, here's our cartoon of our two object files again. Um, so main needs to call these functions foo and bar. They're undefined. They're going to be in our libraries. In foo, it's going to call this log function, which is also undefined. And then um, let's just imagine we've got some uh, global data here for this string uh, that it's going to log. So this, this is a reference to something that's in the same uh, object file. Um, so the linker can resolve these uh, internal uh, references and anything that it finds in other object files. But once it's finished and we've compiled our shared library, then these are all still undefined. They're undefined because we don't know what address they're going to have yet. So uh, log, foo, and bar are all undefined. So what does the linker actually do at this point? Well, we, we're going to give it a list of shared libraries to link against. And uh, it's pretty much going to make a note that we need to load this at runtime. So we're going to record in here, I require this shared library. Um, and it's an instruction to the loader to please find this library uh, and load it when we run the program. Uh, and similarly here. So normally, your linker would go and check, are these undefined symbols actually defined in any of the shared libraries you said to link against? And if none of them have it in, then maybe that's a, a warning or an error. But um, that's not always the case. You can just tell your linker not to do that. And there are situations in which you, you can't run that check, because you don't have any library to show the linker at that point that has the symbols in. Um, and uh, I ran into this while trying to compile things to run with Python, where uh, you have to leave symbols undefined because they're actually in the Python executable at runtime. There's no way to tell it this. So sometimes you end up having to turn on this uh, flag to leave things uh, undefined uh, at build time. So yeah, uh, at runtime, are we going to find these files? Maybe. Uh, when we find these files, are they going to contain the, uh, the symbols we're looking for? They might do. They might not. Uh, it's pretty exciting, but uh, yeah, if they're not there, I guess you know that's that's someone else's problem, like a, a user or someone. So let's just quickly touch then on um, on finding the files and see if that was the problem with our our uh, our broken code example. Um, I don't want to spend lots of time on this because there's tons of fiddly details that are quite uh, OS specific and. Uh, um, yeah, it's not very interesting to go through all of them. Uh, also, this is a, a C++ meetup, so I, uh, I should probably talk about C++ at some point. But uh, yeah, let's have a quick look anyway. So we said that when we, uh, wrong one, when we build these guys, we're going to record the names of the libraries we want. So we can see that directly on the, uh, the file we've built. So here I'm on Linux again. I'm using readelf to look at the elf file directly, readelf-d to look at the dynamic uh, section. Uh, and here we go. Here's a list of the libraries that it says it needs. Um, so we've got the ones from our project up here. And we've got a load of uh, uh, standard libraries as well. Um, also, this rpar thing that many of you will be uh, familiar with, we, our build system is also <laughs> stuck in here, uh, our library path we want to be searched for dependencies of this executable. 
Um, so then if you want to figure out how ld.so is actually going to load uh, everything, there is the, the man page. I'm not going to go through it all, but basically it looks in a series of places in order, including that R path we just saw. There's an environment variable and some fallback paths. And these R paths you build in, they can also specify relative paths, which is pretty useful. So you can deploy your executable and say, yeah, I want to look in the, I want to look in the directory just next to me for, for my library files. And then you have a sort of self-contained set of files that you can, uh, you can put out together. Um, now, you might be wondering why I didn't just run uh, LDD, um, which many of you will know. Um, so LDD is slightly different. Um, that actually simulates the whole process of loading, not just the executable and its libraries, but also the transitive dependencies. Um, and it's applying the current environment, so uh, your environment variables, your working directory here will have affect the result. So it's a very useful tool, but it's something slightly different. I wanted to show what the static linker has put uh, in the file. But LDD shows you what's going to happen when you try and run it. Um, all right, so does any of this exist on OS X? Yes, so there's this uh, otool command that uh, you can use to look in the Mac O format binaries that we have on OS X. As you can see, I'm just trying to pull some of the output out because it's very uh, verbose. But yeah, similar idea. We've got a list of libraries that's been recorded that we need to load. Um, you can see some differences already. We have whole paths here, not, um, not just a file name. Uh, and you can also see there's uh, some kind of R path here. Um, again, the man page. Uh, tells you the full beautiful details of the process it goes through. It's quite a bit more complex than Linux. The one thing I would say, although OSX has RPARs, they do not work the same way as on Linux. So that's uh, a trap you can fall into. Um, on Linux, if there are RPARs there, every library is looked for in those. On OSX, it's not like that. It's only the ones that have this special at RPARs. It's going to try substituting your RPARs in there. So yes, just another of the fun. Um, little complications you can run into. All right, so that's library loading. And it looks like, uh, in this case, the libraries that we were looking for are being found. Uh, so that's not, our, that's not our problem here. So what happens when we actually do find the file and we're going we're gonna to run the thing? Because we still have those uh, unresolved symbols to deal with. So we've loaded these into memory. We've decided what address everything is at. Uh, but we still have the issue of what we're going to put in, uh, in these gaps. We, uh, we need to call this function somehow. Um, so you might think that the, uh, the obvious answer here is to do what the static linker does, but to do it when we, when we run. So we know where our logger library is, so we know the real address of log. So let's write the real address in here now and do the same for, for foo and for bar. And you can do that. Uh, the usual name for that would be load time relocation, and it works. You can still do this on Linux, um, but uh, it's almost never used. Um, and there is one main reason why it's not used. Um, so hands up everybody who really, really likes long link times. Good. No. Oh, we have one sociopath in the room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no one likes a slow link. So imagine going through that process every time you start your program. Um, that's one of the biggest reasons that we don't do this. Um, there is another reason. If we want to do that with our shared libraries, that means you've, you're now going to have to modify the text section of your library to put real addresses in. That means you can't share them between processes anymore, because every process has to have it separately modified, um, which could, you know, maybe the amount of RAM doesn't seem like a big issue these days. But if you're in a RAM-constrained environment, it could be. Plus, as another part of the slow load time, you'd have to do that for every process using the library. So, um, so that's not really what we do. Instead, we have the concept of uh, position-independent code. So position-independent in code, what does that mean? Once we've actually written this file and the static link is finished, that means we can load this at any address with no modification, and it's going to work, basically. Um, and this is 
becoming the norm for executables as well. Although uh, on things like Linux, there's a default address that your executable will go to, so your linker can just rely on that. Nowadays, uh, there are some security concerns because there's some vulnerabilities that rely on uh, that fixed address. So um, on things like Android, for example, it's now the default to just load these to randomized addresses, which means your executable also has to be position independent. So once you've finished linking, it can go anywhere. Um, so how does that actually work? Let's go back and have a look. So to make this uh, position independent, there are, uh, I guess, two key things that we have to do. For the first one, let's just think about uh, something like this reference here, which was meant to be down to this guy. What are we going to put here when we're com writing this file? We obviously can't put the absolute address of this because we don't know what it's going to be. And we're not allowed to modify it afterwards. Uh, but we can put in a relative address because the static linker knows the whole memory layout of, of this thing. So we can put the CPU instructions in here to say, wherever I am, go forward this many bytes. And, uh, and that's where the, the data is. So pretty much all of these internal uh, references are going to be relative, uh, relative uh, addressing. Um, this is actually very efficient on modern uh, CPUs that's sort of optimized for this, especially because uh, if you're on a 64-bit architecture, you can get away with only 32 bits here, unless you're trying to emit more than two gigabytes of library, in which case you probably have another problem anyway. Um, so yeah, these work pretty well. So relative addressing works for those. But what about these references between uh, libraries? What are we going to do about those? We've got to put something here when we write this file that's going to work at runtime, uh, and similarly here. So the answer is here. You have to go through some kind of indirection. So we have some kind of lookup table that the operating system is going to manage for you. Um, so different names on different operating systems. On Linux, there's uh, the, the procedure linkage table and the global offset table. OSX has its die LD stubs and things like that. That's basically the same idea. Um, so what happens is there's a lookup table for this symbol, log, which can be filled in with the correct address. Come back to that in a second. So the code that we emit here just says go and look up for that symbol in the table and then find the real function pointer and then call that. So we end up with an indirect function call here. Uh, and similarly for these guys. So the process of putting the correct address in this table is uh, what we call binding the symbol. So this is the other job that the loader has to do. When something uh, provides this symbol and later something needs it, then we're going to bind to that definition of the symbol. Um, and that doesn't have to happen at startup. In fact, uh, the default generally would be lazy binding, where we don't bind all of these because that can be pretty slow. And you may not want to do all of that at startup. You may not even need them all. Uh, so there's a clever little trick where this actually the first time you call a function like this, the function that it looks at, the pointer that it looks up here, points to the binding function, which goes away and figures out where the real definition is and writes it back into here. So then the next time you call it, you go directly to the actual function. Uh, so yeah, these indirect calls uh, does mean every call into a, a shared library or between shared libraries is, is going to be indirect like this, which depending on your application could be a performance concern, could be not. All right, so that's position independent code, and that's what our lookups look like. But let's get back to our broken example. What was the problem here? So we decided that we've found the right files. We just decided the symbol we're looking for is in the symbol table, but it still doesn't work. So something else is wrong. Just as a sanity check, I'm going to take out these calls to the log function. If I run that one, now it's OK. And the same on uh, Linux, that's happy as well. So going back to our symbol table, obviously looking up foo and bar in our shared library seems to be working fine. The problem is trying to find this guy, um, similarly with OSX. So foo and bar are OK. Um, now, I'm sure many of you already know the answer to this, but for those who don't, I'm going to show you a magic trick. Uh, 
So I just stripped all the symbol tables off these shared libraries. So now foo and bar and our logger library have no symbols at all. Uh, so what happens now if I run the thing? Uh, and that's actually quite happy. And the same thing works on uh, OSX as well. It complains about some of them and doesn't want to remove, but libfoo and libbar, no symbols left. Um, but we can run it fine. So obviously we're missing something. These symbol tables are not the way that we're finding these, uh, these things at runtime. There is another, the dynamic symbol table. So obj dump with uh, dash t will show us the dynamic symbol table. So here we go. So it's independent of the other symbol table. Dynamic symbol table still has your symbol names and your addresses. Uh, but there's a few uh, differences here. Um, it, uh, it doesn't have the concept of local and global symbols, for example. Um, but only symbols in this dynamic symbol table are available to bind against. So if s uh, your symbols are in here, then we say they are, they are visible or they're exported. Uh, if they're not in here, then they are hidden. Um, so what about OSX? Uh, you can also do this, this little guy, diald info is quite useful. And here we're seeing what's exported from our foo library, ensuring us there's our foo symbol. So now let's look at the dynamic symbol tables of all our libraries. libfoo, uh, here we go, libfoo exports foo, libbar exports bar, and our logging library is not exporting anything. That's why it doesn't work. There's nothing there to bind against at runtime. And similarly for Linux. Dynamic symbol table, nothing in it. So that's fine, but then what determines whether something is, uh, is actually exported or not? So this is the concept of visibility. I'm just going to put these back before I forget. So whether things are visible or not is up to your compiler, so you've got to tell it. So compilers generally, they'll have flags to specify the defaults you want. Um, and then if you want to override those, then you put annotations uh, in your code to tell the compiler you want things to be, uh, to be visible or to be hidden. Um, now for Microsoft Visual C++ users, this probably all sounds perfectly normal because the default there is that everything is hidden. And you put DLL export if you want to export it. That's how it's always been. And you can make uh, GCC work much more like that by just telling it to hide everything. And then you indicate what you want to export, which is very much the recommended way to do it, although uh, it's less frequently the way it's actually done. Um, so that's what I did here. I put in the recommended uh, compiler flag, visibility equals hidden. Now everything's hidden, but only for this library. So how would we fix it? Well, we could go to the declaration, and then we can put some uh, attributes on here, blah, blah, blah. I won't bother typing the whole one, but you can indicate here the visibility you want to be default, and then it should become visible again. Um, for now, I'm just going to get rid of this. We'll go back to default GCC behavior, which is now everything's visible. And lo and behold, uh, it works. And we'll just check the Linux one too. Uh, that's happy again. Um, all right, so mystery solved. Um, one more thing though, you might say that's fine, but why was that a runtime error? Why couldn't I detect this at uh, compile time? Well, it's a perfectly reasonable question. For demo purposes, it's because I just turned off the, the check for undefined symbols in the linker. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you are sometimes forced to do that. Sometimes you don't have the library at build time that you're actually going to run against, so you have to deal with this at runtime. Um, but if I Comment these out and get rid of this again. Oh, sorry, I want that on. Now, as expected, at uh, compile time, it's complaining that these symbols are undefined. So it wasn't actually going to do anything with those symbols, just as a reminder, but it is checking for us, does it look like you've provided any libraries that have them in? 
No, you didn't. Uh, that seems to be an error. Uh, same thing over on Linux. All right. So let's put this back to working state. So uh, yeah, we solved the problem. And everything is working. And we learned about visibility on the way. But again, C++ talk. Uh, Let's have a look at what the C++ standard actually has to say about uh, visibility. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, not much help there. Um, yeah, it really just isn't covered by the standard, but we can have a look at what GCC has to say about it. A new form of linkage which we call hidden linkage. Two declarations of an object with hidden linkage refer to the same object if they're in the same shared object. So really, yeah, you are free to decide, I'm going to have this uh, symbol definition invisible from the outside of this shared library uh, if I want to. Um, so we've kind of gone uh, beyond the, the bounds of the standard a little bit now. And this really, I guess, comes back to my motivation for this talk. So I, just, I always find this really interesting that uh, you run into things like this. And this is just your normal part of a C++ life, that you're using all these tools together. And, uh, and they're not talking about things all the same way. All right, but where does this, live? Where does this leave our, uh, our friend, the one definition rule? Are we still applying it or not? Um, so again, back to CPP reference. This is what it says about the one definition rule. One and only one definition is required to appear in the entire program, including any standard and user-defined libraries. Well, it doesn't say anything about shared libraries, but I suppose uh, the point is that if you have multiple definitions after loading your shared libraries, then yeah, you've broken the one definition rule. Um, and it's up to you to, uh, to deal with the consequences and make sure it works. Um, but as we're starting to see, it's actually pretty easy to do. And, and again, just to remember, the compiler is not required to diagnose this violation. You are. <laughs> it's not going to help you with that. And if you break it, then, uh, then who knows what's going to happen. So we've got a bit of time left, so let's break some stuff and see what happens when we do break this. Um, so broadly, I guess there are two cases then where we're obviously going to violate this. Uh, one would be where uh, two shared libraries are defining the same symbol, but they both have them uh, privately. So either it was a local symbol or it's, um, it's a global symbol, but we kept it hidden. It's not visible. Uh, and then the other case is where more than one shared library is providing the symbol and uh, they're visible in both cases. And then your loader has got more than one to choose from. Um, so yeah, let's look at the, the first one now. Uh, all right, so our shared uh, logger library works fine. Uh, but then we decide, OK, uh, calling into a shared library to do our log, we're worried about the indirect function call, and maybe it's slow. I've got a great idea. Let's statically link the logging library into our other libraries, but we'll still build foo and bar as shared libraries. Makes sense. Uh, so we'll do it like this. Um, so what do we think is going to happen here? I'm just going to do a quick clean. I'll build this. OK, it works. But if we look a bit closer. Something's a bit wonky because now we have two of these. Uh, let's go look at our symbol table. Uh, well, our logger instance uh, doesn't appear here. That makes sense because we, uh, we didn't export it. I'm on the right window. Oh, here we go. This is the OSX one. Here's our dynamic symbol table, and here's our real symbol table. And lo and behold, this is our logger singleton. It now appears in both of our libraries. It's become a, uh, a bit of a doubleton. So it's obviously not quite what we intended. Um, let's have a look at the Linux case as well. Yep, same thing there. It's not in the uh, dynamic tables, but again, we get uh, one of these in each of our um, libraries. So um, is this actually an error, you might ask? Let's go uh, look again. So this is meant to be our logger singleton. It's got static uh, storage duration. 
So supposedly that means the storage is allocated when the program begins and deallocated de when the program ends and only one instance exists. But now that seems more like an aspiration than, uh, than a reality because of course we can have things with static storage duration allocated when we load libraries on the fly and as we can see here we can easily end up with more than one of them in our program. Um, and there's really nothing the, uh, the compiler or linker can do to, to help you avoid this. Um, you either need to know you're doing this and do it deliberately um, or just not do this. Um, and you can imagine the, uh, the kind of mess you can get into with, with uh, duplicate symbols like this. Okay, but what about the other case where uh, we're going to have our symbols exported and visible so it's all out in the open that we've got more than one of them, what happens then? Um, so I'm just going to check out a slightly different version of the code for this. Sorry. Okay. So what did I change? So now our little foo library has gained a tiny helper function inside. Uh, we stuck it in the CPP file because it's just meant to be private to this library. We're not using it from anywhere else. And we're going to call it from here. Simple as that. And then you can probably guess what's coming over in bar. He also has a little helper function called the same thing. Again, just private to this library. Um, so I'm sure uh, many of you will see what the problem is here. Although these are in the CPP files, that's actually uh, irrelevant. This guy still has uh, external uh, linkage. So uh, this symbol is going to clash uh, with the one from Foo. Um, so that should mean, if we're going to link all these statically together, that we're going to get uh, an error. And lo and behold, yes. There's a duplicate symbol. You can't do this. Let's try the Linux version. Yeah. Um, so then what, we have, what will happen if we do the shared library version and then run it? Are we going to get the same kind of duplicate symbol error? No, nope, that's fine. But now the answer is 83. So what has happened here? If we have a look at our dynamic symbol tables again, here is uh, the answer from libfoo. Here is the answer from libbar. So both of them are now uh, available to be bound to. Uh, they're both exported. But to get 83 means that both of the calls to this must have used the, the same one. Um, so yeah, that's really not what we uh, we intended, and apparently it was not an error for the linker or the loader, which maybe that's a surprise, maybe it's a not, but not only is this not an error, this is positively encouraged to have more than one symbol definition at runtime. Uh, in fact, yeah, this is how uh, symbol interposition works if you, uh, if you ever play with uh, LD preload on, on Linux. So you load your own library first, and it exports a symbol. Uh, and when you run your main program, the one exported from your first library is already there, and then all the references to that symbol bind to that one. So you can override the behavior of that function just by loading the other library first. Um, so yeah, you're free to have uh, as many definitions of these symbols as you want, and it's, it's not an error. And if you're loading libraries on the fly with DL open, you can pull even more tricks. You can, uh, you can access multiple definitions and, uh, and say, I want to call the next one now, and, and things like that. But you might say, hang on, that's all well and good, but when we define this function here, it's only used from the same translation unit. So when we compiled this library, why didn't this get resolved directly to here as an internal relocation, uh, in which case everything would work? Um, and the answer is because you have to support uh, being able to interpose and override these symbols. So this, when we call it, is a visible uh, external symbol. And so that call has to go through that same lookup table we were, we were looking at earlier, just in case you were planning to override it with something else at runtime. 
So the calls from both libraries go through the table and end up calling the same one. So uh, we're breaking the ODR again in, a, in another way. Loader knows about it, doesn't really care. So does that mean the rule then is the first one that you load wins? In which case we're going to see the same behavior on OSX for our shared library. But no, this seems to work. So what's going on there? So there's another surprise in there. OSX has this concept of the two-level namespace. I'm curious, actually. Hands up if you know all about two-level namespace. <laughs> yeah, so it surprised me as well. Um, so going back to what happens when we are uh, building, I said that all we'd really do is record the library uh, that we want to run. That's actually not true on OSX. It also looks at the libraries you linked against. And if it finds uh, a symbol in one of those, then it remembers which symbols it found in which libraries. And then at runtime, it's going to only bind those symbols against those library files, if it found them at all. Um, and so that actually uh, makes the symbol interposition I described impossible, at least not without a whole load more effort. Uh, but it also kind of saved us here, um, that we got the right answer. But anyway, another one of those OS-specific uh, tricks to fall into. Uh, but can we, can we still break it? Well, yes, we can tell the, the linker. Uh, I just want to use flat namespace, not interested in the two-level namespace. Uh, and then, lo and behold, we're back to 83. So we broke it again. Um, yeah. All right. I also mentioned that uh, there's the possibility of loading things on the fly. Uh, so there isn't time to demo this. But uh, on Linux and OS X, yeah, you can use this DL open to just load a library from disk and put it in your virtual address space. But then what happens with the duplicate symbols then? Um, and here, basically, you've got two options to choose between. Uh, you can choose global, which means anything you just loaded is available to bind against for any more libraries you're going to load later. Or local, which means it's not. Each one you load in turn uh, is doing its own thing. Um, and a real world example of where this uh, matters actually is, uh, again, Python modules. If you're building Python modules in, uh, in C++, then they're shared libraries. Uh, and Python uses DL open to, to load them. Uh, so if it's going to use the global setting, then symbols from the first module you loaded are then going to be the ones used for all other modules you load after that. But if uh, it's local, then they're going to work independently, which is more what you'd expect. Um, and yeah, fun fact, the C Python implementation doesn't specify which one in the call to DL open. It leaves it to the default. Um, and the final kicker, the default on Linux is local. The default on OSX is global. And that's how I lost two days of my life to Python modules. Um, all right, so wrapping up. Uh, in that tour, we ran into a whole bunch of new concepts, the, the dynamic symbol table and the two-level namespace on OSX. Uh, the idea of visibility, hidden visibility, and this hidden linkage idea. Um, library paths and finding libraries on disks and R paths and so forth. Uh, and then the idea that you can have duplicate symbols uh, at runtime in your loader. Not just allowed, but uh, it's actually a feature. So in conclusion, what can I say? Uh, if you want to avoid breaking ODR, yeah, the compiler, the linker, and the loader, they're not going to save you from this. Um, all you can do is make sure you plan your library structure, Decide where you're, gonna, where you're gonna put everything, uh, what behavior you actually want. And yeah, I do recommend, uh, as GCC does, that you, uh, you use hidden visibility and expose what you want to expose. Um, and yeah, again, don't be afraid of your linker, get to know it, uh, read the manual and the surrounding tools, and hopefully uh, that'll help actually diagnose what's going on. Uh, all right, that's it from me, thanks very much. Uh, got time for a couple of questions now, and then uh, I think we're going to take a pizza and beer break before the next talk. So if anyone has one. Um, so, 
question. If you override this last string, if you override the symbol by your own uh, one, is there a way to reference to the old one that do like some changing, or is it lost forever? So yeah, the question is if you if you preload your own library to override the symbol, can you still refer the other one, um, or is it lost forever? Um, I think again that's OS specific. I think in general, no, you can't. But with the DL open, you can. When you DL open, you can sort of iterate through the the different definitions that are available. Um, but yeah, uh, it varies again from OS to OS. Yeah. If you DL open the library that's already DL open, then you have uh, if it's the same file name, then it's a now op because it's already loaded. Can you iterate over symbols then to get to your original library? Maybe, I don't know. You can try that and tell us on the meetup group if it worked. <laughs> oh, just to repeat the question, sorry, he was asking if you DL open the same library again, can you then get uh, the original symbol or, or what's going to happen? You can just increment the ref count. I think so too, yeah. Yeah? Can you have mutually dependent DLLs? Uh, yes, you can. Um, yes, I think that generally that works. Once they're uh, both loaded, then the lazy binding can, can go both ways. That's not a problem. The question was, can you have mutually dependent libraries? Uh, one more, maybe? Oh, is it a joint question? <laughs> okay, yeah, the question is, uh, is module supposed to fix this? I really don't know. Um, so I, I'm no expert on modules. Um, I did wonder about trying to include that in this talk, but uh, from what I've read, it's not clear how much of this gets cleaned up with, with modules. I know that there is the new concept of module linkage, which starts to sound suspiciously like hidden linkage, but I'm not sure if they're actually going to end up being the same concept or not in the implementation. Um, but it would be great, maybe someone could do a talk on, uh, on uh, using C++ modules and uh, how the picture changes. I'm not going to do that, by the way, but uh, uh, maybe someone could. Yeah? Uh, is inlining affected by setting a simple um, visible? Yeah, good question. So uh, is inlining uh, affected by making symbols visible was the question. Uh, so yeah, if you have something with um, external linkage and it's inline, then the, in, the in the dynamic symbol table, it can also be marked as weak there. So the same uh, weak process applies uh, and only one of them will be picked. So inlines actually work reasonably intuitively if they're visible. Can you talk about anonymous namespace as help with this? Um, so the question was, do anonymous namespaces help with this? So I think yes, in that uh, it's an easy way to make things have internal linkage if that's what you were intending. So in our example where we had that function, the answer, if that was in an anonymous namespace, then uh, it would be internal linkage and we wouldn't have had this uh, problem. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, uh, I will finish there, uh, help yourself to uh, some more snacks, and then we'll start the second talk in what, about ten, ten, ten minutes or so? Yep. Cool, thank you.